No, not. Our next speaker is Jennifer McKinney. Jennifer McKinney is a doctoral candidate at Oklahoma State University. Her current research examines how photographs manipulate the way we remember the past. Her focus is on the Dakota Indians in Minnesota and their war against the United States in 1862. She received her Bachelor of Arts degree in History and Master of Arts in American Studies from Baylor University. Jennifer worked at Gilcrease Museum for two years with the digital curation team working to digitize and catalog the collections at Gilcrease and the Albert Center for American Research. In addition to teaching at Oklahoma State University, Jennifer has worked for the Dr. Pepper Museum in Waco, Texas, and the National Park Service. Please help me, help me welcome Jennifer McKinney. Um, okay, so just a few things. Congratulations for making it to the very end of the day. Uh, I uh, want to thank uh, Dr. King and Dr. Panther. Um, Natalie and I have been friends since graduate school, um, and when they asked me to do this talk, I told them that I'm not really sure if it would work well with what I research and stuff, but um, I did it anyways, and I really appreciate their support. Um, like Dr. King said, I used to work here, I worked here for two years and just recently quit, maybe like uh, five or six months ago. Um, so today's been awesome, um, especially seeing all my familiar faces um, and just spending the day with my family here at the Go Crease. Um, I worked in the digital curation team, so I got to see a lot of the collections here on this campus. And what was really interesting was literally the week I'm leaving, uh, we found these beautiful advertisements in the anthropology collection. That's one of them. And they advertised this panorama made by John Stevens. Um, and we quickly made the connection between the advertisements in the anthropology collection with the panorama that we have in the art storage over at Gilcrease Museum. Furthermore, we have photographs here at the Helmberg Center of American Research, and all together they um, are all about this event that's happening in Minnesota, and it is the event that I've been studying for the last eight years. Um, I wrote my thesis on, and I'm writing my dissertation on it. So it all just kind of worked out really well, and um, so it's, it was fun to kind of dive into that aspect a little bit um, and talk about um, the panorama there are the paintings uh, by um, Henry Cross. I don't talk about them too much, uh, but I do have a few photos of them. Um, so it's, it's, to me, it was just spectacular and surprising that there was all of these amazing resources here. It took me two years to find them. I find them the week that I'm leaving, and um, they pertain precisely to what I'm studying. So um, that's basically what I'm going to talk about today. Um, there are a few uh, disclaimers that I need to... Uh, Say, um, I am in the midst of writing my dissertation. That is the reason I left the Go Crease Museum, um, which means that my brain is fried and I'm in the middle of this huge project. So if this seems really disjointed and um, jumps around a bit, it's because it does. And um, <laughs> so bear with me. Um, this is also a bit off topic. So we've been talking about native artists all day. What I'm going to talk about is how objects, particularly photographs and panoramas, inspired the way we remember our Native artists, or Native Americans, or in my case, the Dakota Indians. Um, a lot of what I particularly research is the way photographs manipulate our understanding um, of events. They essentially manipulate the way we remember the past. And what this is going to kind of hopefully, fingers crossed, prove to everyone here is that photographs of the Dakota Indians inspired things like the paintings by Cross, the panoramas done by um, John Stevens, and helped formulate sort of this national consensus on how we're going to remember this terrible event from 1862. So I'm going to talk about that. I will talk about what happens in 1862. It is sad and 
depressing and terrible, um, but it's really important to understand what happened, why it happened, and the consequences of that, because I think it helps fulfill this whole picture, and it also reminds us um, of how that story and that particular event history was remembered for so long in so many different ways, and how today we remember it almost completely differently. But I'm not going to argue that it's those photographs and those other types of images that really did manipulate people right after 1862 um, and, and uh, sort of cast our native artists in um, a very bad light. Um, and perhaps um, it will give us an indication as to why native artists struggled for so long to find audiences to appreciate their work. Hopefully. Hopefully we will make that connection. Um, no promises. But I, I, I'm going to try really hard. And I want to hopefully keep this nice and short and sweet because it's Friday and it's 5 o'clock somewhere. So. <laughs> Uh, John Stevens, a talented sign painter from Utica, New York, took his craft out west in the 1850s where he encountered many new and exciting forms of primitive entertainment. John Stevens had established a homestead and business in Minnesota where he witnessed the ingenuity of craftsmen, showmen, and artists alike using their skills as entertainers in rural America. Hungry for amusing diversions, People in Minnesota came out in huge numbers to see circus performances, traveling shows, and picture shows where images projected onto a screen dissolved into a continuous flow of images. It is also likely that the talented sign painter encountered panorama shows. Panorama shows use painted pictures or scenes on a long strip of canvas to deliver a fantastic story that combines images with theatrical performance, a narrator, and sometimes live music. The canvas was rolled up like a scroll and unrolled using a mechanical device that was hand cranked by a stagehand. As images unrolled, the narrator described the scenes to the audiences using his own showmanship, lights, music, or other devices to make the presentation spectacu spectacular and unique. Um, panoramas were considered the first moving pictures and the precursor to modern film. This was the premier entertainment for rural Americans in the late 19th century. The panorama's emergence was intertwined with the onslaught of capitalism, imperialism, urbanism, all the isms, and the long run, and in the long run, the emerging era of the masses. So this is mass entertainment. This is Twitter, Facebook, the latest Avengers movie, all of that rolled into one. So John Stevens saw an opportunity to make a living using his artistic talent as a painter by creating panoramas to entertain his fellow Minnesotans and bordering states. Um, having the ability to paint, to narrate, and to travel, he just needed a story to tell. That story came to him in 1862 when the Minnesota frontier lit up in August after a group of Dakota Indians attacked their agency and waged war for over 40 days. I also have allergies, so I apologize. Okay. I'm going to go through a bit of the backstory just so that we all are on the same page. And this is where it gets really choppy and weird. Um, the emergence of violence, or the eruption of violence and chaos on the Minnesota Plains in 1862 arose from years of posturing between the United States government and the Dakota people. Exploitation, mismanagement, and the lack of attention brought the two nations to a breaking point. The actual war itself sprang out of happenstance from years of repressed anger and resentment directed towards the United States government. Government officials, white settlers, white traders, who caused the Dakota pain and anguish. The cultural history of the Dakota Indians, the building of the relationship between the United States and the Dakota, and then the fracturing of that relationship caused the fissure so deep that some Dakota saw no other option but to strike against the white man and his government. That's what my thesis was on, by the way. <laughs> the result of the War of 1862 devastated not only men, women, and children who lost their lives, property, and loved ones, but also the relationship between the two nations. The United States forced the Dakota to leave Minnesota, banished from their homeland, and campaigned to hunt down and kill every warrior that ran and did not stand trial for his crimes. Besides killing the Dakota in a mass public execution, 
The government imprisoned the remaining Dakota and escorted the nation out of Minnesota. Historians generally agree that the causes of the spontaneous war in 1862 began many years before while the United States tried to use diplomacy to suppress the Dakota. Beginning in 1837, the government made several treaties with the Dakota exchanging money and annuities for land. The Treaty of Mendota and Traverse to Sioux in 1851 gave away much of the land in Minnesota, and the 1858 treaties resigned the tribes to an even smaller strip of land south of the Minnesota River. And this is a group of uh, Yachtan, am I saying that right? Yeah, Yachtan Sioux, which is a tribe of the, the Dakota Nation, or a band of the Dakota Nation. Um, these were likely not participants of the war, they were considered friendly Indians. This is a fantastic image. I've actually not come across this image in any of my research of any of the delega delegates who would go in groups to DC <coughs> to, to meet with the Great Father and negotiate money in order for them to sell their land. So this is an actual new photo to me, which is fantastic. Um, and actually, I've never seen this in any of the books that I've researched either. And it's here, in this building. Which is really cool. <laughs> the biggest upset revolved around the claims made by traders or store, key, store clerks who had allowed the Dakota to purchase goods on credit. When the annuity money arrived from the treaties, came to the tribes, the government allowed the traders to cash in on the credit. Charges that greatly exceeded the value of their products. Now in debt, with little land restrictions on their movement throughout the reservations, and the constant influence of white settlers threatened the Dakota's peace of mind about their place in Minnesota. Corruption, mismanagement, and happenstance all combined to create a volatile mixture. In August of 1862, the Dakota Indians, under the advisement of their agent Thomas Galbraith, or Galbraith, had finished renovating the agencies, had planted corn and other crops, and waited patiently on the arrival of their annual annuity money. Many of the stores around the agency had stopped giving out credit to the Dakota, likely because of the late annuity payments, <coughs> and taunted the Dakota with speculation on whether or not they would ever see their annuity. So the money was late, store traders are not making the situation any better, and it just really sucks to be a Dakota in August of 1862. Life's not great. Um, Anxious for their money and their current supplies dwindling, the Dakota took charge of the situation on August 4th by storming a warehouse in the upper agency and helping themselves with the stockpile of goods that the agent had hoarded all summer. Gelbreth claims that he wanted to make what few supplies he had in possession last the entire summer and had not anticipated the delay of annuities had become very strict in giving out food to the Dakota. It eventually took a lieutenant and a loaded howitzer to stop the confiscation of goods. Therefore, the standoff at upper agency led to a meeting between the leaders of the Dakota tribe and the government officials. The speaker on behalf of the Dakota, a man named Little Crow, made the case that the tribe had used up the food and supplies delivered to them throughout the summer and could not subsist on what little remained. In essence, they were starving, despite the bountiful harvest that most anticipated that fall. Little Crow asked that, quote, some arrangement be made by which we can get food from the stores, because when men are hungry, they help themselves. The agent turned the discussion over to the four storekeepers, or they're called traders, um, who turned to a man named Andrew Merrick for his reply. After much deliberation, Merrick rose to leave the council and remarked, so far as I'm concerned, if they're hungry, let them eat grass. The uproar of the Dakota took over the room, but subsided when Captain Marsh strongly encouraged the agent to issue any available goods to the Dakota. And in all accounts, this event, after the distribution of the goods, all of them dissipated and things went back to normal on the agencies. Um, I will note that there is plenty of scholarship out there that um, hotly debates whether or not Andrew Merrick actually made that comment, um, but it is really prevalent in this history. And uh, almost every account that I read says that he was one of the first people to die when the war broke out and they found him later with grass stuffed in his mouth. Um, it makes for an interesting story. It makes for an interesting beginning. 
It also gives that nice little spark that ignites the war. Um, but that's something in my personal research and in my professional research, I'm trying to debate whether or not that was actually spoken. It's very similar to whether or not Marie Antoinette actually said, let the meat cake. Which I think historians say no. I'm not a Europeanist. Um, the actual war in 1862 began a few weeks later on August 18th after a very brief early morning meeting between some of the Dakota leaders. Once disgraced for his participation in signing the 1858 treaty, Little Crow steps forward as a leader and led the attacks on the upper and lower Sioux agencies. Unorganized and chaotic, the battle was waged across the Minnesota prairie for 40 days until a group of captives and friendly Dakota chose not to who chose not to fight, surrendered to the government at a place called Camp Release. Most of the warriors that participated in the battles fled Minnesota to Canada or west out of the state. The majority, overwhelming majority, of the Dakota population were friendly, and I say friendly because that's the term most historians are using in this particular event. Um, they did not participate in the violence but shared in the punishment. So they're going to be corralled and placed in a camp at Fort Schnelling before they're forced to relocate to reservations outside of Minnesota. Those warriors were captured, those that were captured stood in trial at a makeshift courthouse presided over by five military men. Considered as a gross injustice, trials quickly commenced, commenced and found many Dakota men guilty of murder with little evidence, <coughs> hastily rushing through the proceedings so that in a matter of weeks, a total of 303 Dakota Indians were found guilty and condemned to death. The list of the condemned landed on President Abraham Lincoln's desk, who approved of only 39 of the convictions, much to the dissatisfaction of many Minnesota settlers. On December 26, 1862, 38 of Dakota, one man had received a pardon, marched to the center of town in Mankato, <coughs> excuse me, walked onto the scaffold and died together in the largest mass public execution to date in United States history. And just a caveat, really sorry about this, I talked for an all day. <coughs> um, I remember sitting in an undergraduate class, which wasn't too long ago, but it feels like ages, and my civil war professor spoke about this event, and it was just a slide and a, you know, an hour and a half long lecture, and he said it was the largest mass public execution to date in the United States history. Boom. And I thought, how have I never heard of this? And why did I not learn about it? All the history classes that I've taken, all the intro classes that I took, um, it could be bad education. I have no idea. But they was a great education. Like, how did I you know, go so long in that history program without hearing about this event? Um, and that's one of the things that got me into why do we remember things certain ways and other things other ways. Um, and we'll likely... Hopefully, fingers crossed in my conclusion, make some kind of connection between the way photographs have distorted the truth and subsequently this particular event in history has sort of faded from our memories. Our memories. Um, but it still holds that out of title, <coughs> which is ridiculous, but it's um, fascinating. Okay, the remainder of the prisoners and the 1,700 friendly Dakota received banishment from their home in Minnesota. The prisoners made their way south to Davenport, Iowa and stayed in custody at Camp McClellan until 1864 when those still alive received a presidential pardon and joined their tribes and families in Nebraska, <coughs> goodness, on the Santee Reservation. Though some managed to move back to Minnesota, after the events of 1862, the Dakota no longer held a strong presence in Minnesota. Punitive expeditions were later <coughs> led by uh, General Sibley and General Sully, who hunted and chased the Dakota in Minnesota and northern South Dakota. I may not make it. Okay. <coughs> so, that story done. I'll try to stop coughing. Um, this brings me to the Gilcrease, now that we've done our uh, fun chat. This is another advertisement. Um, this is going to be uh, about the size of like a full-size sheet, and it looks like it's painted on a sheet as well. 
And John Stevens would have hung these on like a, a wagon, and he would use that wagon to travel all over the country. Um, and the reason why it's called diaphanous is because what he did, which made it really special, was he would put the light behind the screen so that it sort of illuminated and created um, a movie-like picture. Um, and another interesting thing to note is that the uh, panorama here uh, scrolls vertically. And um, a lot of the panoramas that I've encountered scroll horizontally. Uh, so that was interesting. Okay, the Opus Museum has one of two known surviving panoramas made by John Stevens, depicting the U.S. Uh, Dakota War of 1862. Carefully tucked away in storage, the panorama has 36 scenes painted in oil on thin canvas, stands about 6 feet tall and is over 200 feet in length. Included in the storage is the original mechanism used to display the panorama. Recently rediscovered in the anthropology collection is the three large poster advertisements promoting John Stevens' diaphanous panorama. Staff members quickly made <coughs> sorry, the connection between the advertisements and the large panorama held in Gilchrist's art storage. This unique discovery highlights the expansive and rare collections at Gilchrist Museum. Since few panoramas have survived, it is quite exceptional to have a fully functional panorama with accompanying advertisements in one location. <coughs> so they don't survive very well because they're not high art, they're not high quality. Um, these are going to be quick designs that a painter is going to paint on a canvas that's either a really long canvas or a bunch of pieces of canvases that have been stitched together. He's going to show this thing all over, he's going to travel with it, <coughs> and it's going to wear itself out. And so what we normally see when we see uh, panoramas is um, really fragile remnants of what they used to be. So when I decided to write this paper and wanted to talk about the panorama, there was no way we were going to get in storage and roll and unroll our panorama without like 18 conservators and, you know, it just wasn't going to happen. Um, which is good because we don't want anything to happen to it. Um, but we did find a bunch of images of the panorama that were taken probably 20 or 30 years ago, and so I actually have copies of those, and that's what we're going to show you now. Um, but the picture is a picture, so just, you know, bear with me. Um, <clears throat> okay. Furthermore, I was in the Helmholtz Center for American Research with photographs of Native Americans. Um, this is another, this is a third of the advertisement. So now you've seen all three. <clears throat> and you can see it's faded because it too had been worn out being on the outside of that wagon that he rode around in. And this is actually one of the scenes in our panorama. <clears throat> the other panorama I will mention is in the Minnesota Historical Society. And the reason why Gilcrease has this panorama is because Minnesota Historical Society said no in the 1830s, sorry, 1930s when it came up for purchase. They already had one, they didn't want another one. Uh, Thomas Gilchrist got it, and it has been in our collection ever since. Um, I can't remember if Minnesota Historical Society has their panorama on display, but it too has 36 scenes. Some are different. So they are two different panoramas, but they're on the same exact topic. Here are some photographs. Um, that are fabulous but don't fit into my narrative, so I'm just going to show you an example of what we have here um, at the Homework Center. And this guy right here on the far left is Little Crow. So I've talked about him, so you can kind of take a look at him. Um, photographs of the Dakota Indians dispersed. Oh, hold on. Interestingly, the photographs found in the archives appear to directly influence the way John Stevens painted his panorama. It is clear that photographs of the Dakota taken both before and after the war were inspirations for Stevens. Photographs of the Dakota Indians dispersed throughout the United States both before and after the war because of the popularity among shoppers and the affordability of those photographs. <coughs> Photograph uh, photographs fed consumer cravings for exotic and exciting images. Tourists could purchase relatively cheap photographs and they could display them in personal albums 
to document their travels or to remind them of places they wanted to go. A lot of what uh, we're going to see uh, in the mid to later half of the uh, 19th century are um, what we call CDVs, which are little, they almost look like um, baseball cards. And you could uh, mass produce these, photographers could, and you could sell them for pretty cheap, which basically meant it was a really lucrative business. So it's very similar to the way you're going to go to the Gilchrist uh, shop and buy a reproduction of something we have here. Or you want to take that home with you so you remember what you saw here or give it to as a gift for somebody. Um, that's what we're finding with these CDVs. Um, these are not CDVs. These are 8 by 10s These are fairly large reproductions. Um, but they, I have seen these reprinted uh, in the small version. Um, so that's what we see a lot of, which basically means John Stevens has plenty of access to these photos. Um, this is also um, a picture of the panorama in the far right, a painting done by Cross, and photographs that we have here in the archives, just to give you an idea that we have an enormous amount of material on this particular topic, which is great. Um, historian John Bell describes John Stevens' panorama as a, quote, epic propaganda performance that treated the elimination of Indians as an inevitable and ultimately reasonable consequence of manifest destiny, pioneer expansion across the continent to the Pacific. For residents of Minnesota, justifying expansion and manifest destiny held high importance in their state agenda. If the Dakota War in 1862 was a reaction to expansion in Minnesota, then John Stevens' panorama was used to justify the expansion in the same vein, and in the same vein, demonize the Dakota for their actions in 1862. In many of the scenes, Stevens portrays white settlers in their homes, working in the fields, or behaving politely to the Dakota. He then portrays the Dakota as the physical aggressors, attacking white settlers using excessive violence and destroying the tranquil scenes he had painted earlier. Scene 10, which is this scene right here, is a great example of the juxtaposition between the violent Dakota and the innocent Minnesota settlers. As the settlers lie in wait in the tall grass, the Dakota loom in the distance below dark clouds, highlighting the tension growing on the frontier as attacks sprang up without notice and caused massive damage to the settlers and their land. Um, and there's an actual fantastic story behind this scene about a particular family called the Eastlicks. Um, I don't have time to delve into it, but um, it's an uh, interesting story. Okay. Furthermore, students paint the settlers on a rich and prosperous backdrop of farmland and bountiful harvest. Scene six, shown here, shows a Mr. Cook fetching water for a group of Dakota who happened upon his home. In the background, you can see endless fields of grain ripe for harvest and rolling fields of bountiful Minnesota frontier. The settlers are shown working with nature by planting and working the earth. Again, Stevens adds the Dakota to these images as the obvious aggressors, or quote, bad guys, by having them rush into the scene, storm the frontier's home and land, and fire upon him as his back was turned. Essentially, Stevens depicts a very biased picture of the events of 1862. Yes, the Dakota Indians did attack white settlers, killing and pillaging as they made their way across the agencies. However, that group was comparatively small in relation to the entire Dakota nation, located in the northern and southern agencies where the war is going to occur. They did use violence against the white settlers, but not all of the white men were innocent. Not unlike many other events pertaining to the West, the Dakota War of 1862 is not without its own distortion distorted reality, villains, and redemption, which, again, the dissertation is going to focus on that. Um, many ideas exist as to why the Dakota took, uh, took to violence on 18, August 18, 1862, and the predominant theories for the war include the very late annuity payments and shipment of goods, the near-starving conditions of the summer of 1862, and that one extemporaneous comment made by Andrew Merrick. In the months preceding the war, discussions of the annuity payments and delivery of goods saturated the reservations. Along with waiting for the payments, um, the Dakota discussed the absence of Minnesota men who left to fight in the Union forces in the Civil War and how to 
and had to obtain more credit from Trader Storms. So one of the interesting things about this particular event, and again, it struck me, was it's all happening amidst the Civil War. Um, Lincoln's about to give his Gettysburg, yeah, Gettysburg address, and it's just, you know, there's a lot going on in the nation uh, right now, and then this happens. <clears throat> okay, skip, skip back. Okay, John Stevens' panoramas, uh, panorama ignores the plethora of reasons uh, why the war occurred, occurred and instead focuses on the violence and the atrocities so that the Dakota appears the clear and unmistakable enemy of the white settlers. Again, historian John Bell claims that the panorama, in essence, a pop propaganda machine, created a good versus bad mentality that reinforced the audience notion of settler superiority and the wisdom and inevitability of Western expansion. Stevens further solidifies this by the way he paints certain scenes. And so what I'm showing here is this is Napoleon and his generals because, again, we're talking mass media here and this news real like show that Stevens is putting on. So he, in between some of the scenes, he adds like what's going on in like current affairs. So we have Napoleon and his generals, or just his generals, I'm sorry. But they are framed, they have nameplates, you know, you can clearly see who they are. And on the other side, we have a scene, um, I think, I wrote their names down somewhere. Because I want to say their yes, Rattling Runner, Red Otter, and Thunder Coming, um, who are all supposedly involved in the war. Um, they're just seated there, and if you don't know anything, if you don't know what they look like, you don't know who they are. So basically what I've done is I've gone through photographs and tried to identify each man as best I can. Or I've looked at the transcripts because John Stevens had a transcript that he would read when he went through all the scenes. And again, because of type of strain, I didn't go too far into that. But it's hard to identify the Native Americans in this particular panorama because he doesn't identify them. But he does identify a lot of um, white people. So there's that, and now to the fun stuff. Okay, this is scene nine. It shows a Dakota man called Big Dog, who's on the left. Um, John Otherday, who's in the center, and General Henry H. Sibley. Um, Sibley is going to be the general that's credited with ending the, the war. Um, and these two Dakota are considered friendly, which is why I, I believe they're probably in the same scene with um, the general. Um, and then here's a close picture of um, General Sibley. So, on the far right is the panorama. In the middle is a photograph of a general, or Brigadier General Sibley, his title changes a lot during this time period too, so it's... And then this is the photo, or the painting that we have here at Gilcrease, um, made by Cross. Um, and I, I will say that this particular image I got from the Minnesota Historical Society that photographed, the other two images come from Gilcrease. Um, what's remarkable is that the photograph likely came first. Um, and looks to be very inspirational for the way John Stevens is painting his panorama and even perhaps um, the cross portrait. The only difference I'm seeing is the number of buttons and a little bit of how the profile shifts. Um, but the jacket, the stare, the stash, the hairstyles, it's all very similar. And to me, um, it looks like there's very little artistic license that's going on right now. Um, a bit about the Cross painting. Cross was born in New York, but studied in Paris. He was known for his portrait and animal painting. <coughs> he uh, made many sketches of the Dakota Indians, or the Dakota prisoners, after the war ended. And um, he is known for painting from life. So he is quoted as not saying he painted from photographs or something like that. But this is striking, in my opinion. And I think it deserves a lot more uh, research and looking into. The next is uh, John Other Day. Other Day. Okay. 
He's the one that's seated in the middle. This uh, photograph is uh, part of the uh, collections here. And again, it looks, it looks similar. It's transposed, obviously. Um, but the hat, the way his hand is sitting, his dress, his hair, it all looks quite similar. And John Atherday was noted for um, the way he, uh, there were two refu huge refugee parties during the war, and he's known for leading about 60-odd um, Minnesota settlers away from danger and kept them safe. Um, and so I believe what's happening here is John Stevens is pointing that out and sort of honoring that particular um, act. Um, this image also um, was taken in 1858, that last time that the groups of Dakota went to Washington to, to negotiate a treaty. Um, so obviously the photograph is coming before, and what John Stevens is doing is repurposing it in 1870 during his panorama. Okay, this is scene 14. These show the pro-war Dakota, or the Dakota who are known to have uh, joined in the war forces. We have uh, Shakopee, or Little Six. Uh, other than or Plenty, I believe is his name. I have, I have a hard time identifying one in the middle. And then we have White Dog all the way on the far left. Um, Again, I'm not finding their names anywhere. They're not in the scripts, and um, I'm identifying them through photographs, which I think is easy to do in this particular instance. Shakopee was um, part of the Emma Watson uh, band, which is primarily the band where most of the people who fought the war came from. Um, again. This photo on the right, I'm getting from the Minnesota Historical Society. And this photo in the middle is the photo that's here in our archives. Um, but these photos were taken on the exact same day. So um, I threw this one in here because obviously, again, we're finding similarities in the way their hands are. But it looks like a recreation only it's transposed. Um, this photograph would have been taken in 1864, two years after the war, so plenty of time before John Stevens is going to paint his panorama. Um, and in this particular case, he paints it right. Um, Shakopee did commit atrocities in the war. He was captured and punished, and later uh, sentenced to death and um, was hanged. And, yeah, and then, um, John Stevens is portraying him as the bad guy here. So again, we're kind of getting that that theme and that that way John Stevens is going to try to utilize any Native American photo uh, from the Dakota uprising as pretty much whatever he wants to do with it. Okay, this is um, scene twenty. We have two members here. We have Little Crow in the middle, right here. And then we have, um, goodness, medicine bottle. And then I've identified um, this man as Flying Dog. And again, I do have their Dakota names, but I would stumble over the pronunciations. So I'm using um, their translated names. Um, medicine bottle here. No, I need to talk about Little Crow first. Okay, Little Crow again. Goes to Washington, D.C. in 1868, does the treaty, everyone hates him after that, loses his prestige within the tribe, um, comes back to Minnesota, and he actually cuts his hair, starts to farm, moves into a brick house, and sort of fades away from history. Um, he does make this photograph somewhere between 1860, sorry, 1858 and 1862, so it's before the war, but it's after the treaty was signed. And when the war springs up, um, many of the younger Dakota go to him because they know that he knows a lot of the traditional ways. He's a lot older. He was once respected. And historians, again, argue over exactly what's going on. But a general consensus is that this was his opportunity to take back some of the prestige that he had lost. It was also an opportunity for him to wage diplomacy the way Dakota 
were meant to wage diplomacy, which was to go to war and not to sit there and sign treaties. Um, and again, there's a lot of discussion over motives, but either way, Little Crow, who was completely abiding by the, the outlines of um, the treaties, decides to go to war. Here's his photograph. Again, this photograph is taken four years somewhere between the war. And again, it looks like an exact recreation in the panorama. Um, the uh, photograph here is again all of uh, the Dakota who fought in the war. And um, let's see if I can find it. I'm skipping around, I'm sorry. Um, essentially, what uh, will happen is Stevens in his transcript says something like, before we can get to the violence and the atrocity of the war, first we need to know who does it, or it's, the language is really weird. But that what he's reading right before you see this picture of Little Crow. Um, so you are, as the audience, already get the idea that we're about to look at the bad guys. And this is Medicine Bottle. Medicine Bottle will actually um, flee to Canada with Shakti, which was in the previous photo. They're going to be captured together. This is two years after the war. They'll be tried, convicted, um, and executed together. Um, and they will um, die by hanging on November 11th, 1865, so three years after the war. Um, and that's just remarkable. I mean, I'm pretty sure John Stevens did not come up with this on his own. Um, and this is um, the last thing I'm going to show you. This is uh, scene 26. The man in the middle here, his name is Cutnose. He was known for killing like 20 women and children, five men. Um, there's a lot of terrible, terrible um, uh, stories in the presentation that John Stevens would have done. I've also found it in a lot of the literature. Um, and he will actually be part of the mass execution on um, December 26, 1862. And this is his photo found in our archives as well. Um, it's just striking. And again, this photo is going to be taken before the war. It's going to be taken before 1862, uh, before he had an opportunity to commit any crimes. Um, and then in the center is the cross portrait that we have um, in our art collection. It's not the same. It's definitely a little bit different than the cross portrait that we saw with um, General Sibley. Um, but you get a sense of the profile, the way his mouth and his nose look, the general facial features, it all looks very similar. Um, and it made for uh, an interesting part of the dissertation. I just need to uh, delve into that a little bit more. So essentially, without question, the premise that the Dakota so starved and hungry went to war with the United States lacks evidence and common sense. Multiple factors and various interpretations of those factors can account for some of the reasons why they went to war. Describing the Dakota as weak and hungry, quick to lash out, allowed people in the mid-19th century to justify the violence in Minnesota. It also diverted attention away from the primary triggers of the war, such as inept government practice, practices, corruption among traders and store clerks, failed promises outlined in treaties, and the attempted overhaul of the Dakota culture. John Stevens used his panorama to entertain the masses, reassuring them that the Dakota played the role of the villain and the white settlers the victim. His scenes inspired by actual photos distort the truth about the Dakota War. Images taken at a time of peace are repurposed to create a visual memory based on deception and manipulation. Photographs and other images influenced public opinion went so far as to create a national consensus of Dakota life and culture. Since the birth of photography in 1837, people have set out to capture their own likenesses and that of others, both known and unknown. Other images of far and distant places and the near and familiar have also captivated audiences around the world. Collected by generations of people, photographs continue to demonstrate their ability to animate our history as we look at the images that captivate our curiosity, inspire our future, and guide our interpretations of the past. And that's it. This is actually the last of the uh, scenes in the panorama. 
And this is an idea of what some of the other scenes looks like. This is Camp Release, the day the Dakota surrendered. This is the execution on December 26th. This is Minnehaha Falls in Minnesota. Again, just current stuff for people to look at. And this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. There's two women shaking babies out of a tree. And um, a historian has kind of looked at this, and I have a quote here to hopefully explain this. Um, he says, the ubiquitous clouds still cover the sky, but the soon have disappeared into the ground, and the ground has borne fruit. The settlers, untroubled by threats of savagery, can love, multiply, and move even further west. So I'm assuming what's happening here is it provides comic relief for a very tragic topic. And it also, again, we um, sort of cements this idea of white superiority or white settlers being the victims, um, but having conquered the, the past. Um, and that's it. <laughs>